How's it? And welcome to the first ever episode of Lore and Legends. The Myths of Finland, Part 1. The Creation Story. Now, the creation story can be found, like most mythology of Finland, in the Kalevala. The Kalevala is known as the national epic of Finland. Now, I suggest that anyone with an interest in fantasy and mythology should read this beautiful poem. Famously, J.R.R. Tolkien attributed to the Kalevala much of the inspiration behind the Lord of the Rings, especially the Silmarillion. Now, I've left a link to the English translation on the Gutenberg online archive, and I suggest you give this website a look. I mean, not only are there sacred texts from various religions, but you can find old fantasy stories as well, like, for instance, Lord Dunsany's Gods of Pergana, which is a personal favorite of mine. Now, the traditions of Finnish paganism survived alongside the official Lutheranism in East Finland and Karelia much into the late 20th century. Uh, with the publication of the Kalevala by Elias Lunrot and the upsurge that this caused in Finnish national pride, attempts have been made to recover the ancient mythology, first under the name Ukonusko, which means basically Uko's faith, and later Sumanusko, which translates into Finnish faith. Now, the story of Ilmater and the Pockard eggs most likely finds its origin in Paleolithic culture, as is evidenced by the petroglyphs in the Karelian region. Without getting into too much historical detail, let's dive right in. Hear now the story of the Maiden of Air and the voice of Vanyamoini. In the time before the beginning, there was only light, water, air, and the ether. In the ether resided the vast hall of Lord Uko, the Sky Father and Master of all. The palace was a thing of unimaginable majesty, behind the shade of northern lights and high above the infinite watery expanse. Its walls were made of fog, and its ceilings were rainbow. The echoes from its eight thousand rooms resounded each a different type of emptiness. Its bright windows faced the ether, and the corridors stretched into the infinite, crossing and dividing each other, ever extending and contracting. But one of his children was not content with the thousand halls of emptiness. Restless Ilmata, spirit of the air, was weary of the constant stasis and loneliness in this huge palace. She could never find ease as she swept from room to room, but then one day the tedium was broken. Perhaps it was her father perceiving her yearning. Perhaps it was destiny. But one day she fell from the palace, swallowed into a huge hole that opened above the ether. <laughs> She fell into the never-ending caves of clouds, and though she was as large as the world, to the winds she was as light as feather, and she floated gently down into the waiting ocean. A beauty such as her had never been beheld by any of the primal elements, and longing grew in both wind and water. The two violently competed for possession of her. First the sea would lift her, then growing jealous of the wind's caress it would drag her back. The two quarters grew in competition, until the ocean rose into enraged billows and the wind howled into a furious storm. The two fought as savages, battering her about, indifferent to her shouting. And then there came silence. The maiden lay in the ocean, floating, a maiden no more. From the furious courtship of storm and sea, life had been sown into her belly. As she waited, marveling at the new mystery that had befallen her, she swam, now the mother of waters. She swam for ages, but found only more ocean, and again the loneliness and stasis began to trouble her. She looked upward to find her home, but found she could not see her palace any more. She floated on the ocean, all the while never bearing her child. She floated east, and then west, north, and then south. Sometimes she swam restless and angered. Sometimes she simply floated and directed her attention to admiring the magnificent mystery growing inside of her. All the while, she was alone. 
But then one day she wasn't alone any more. A winged creature, a great and vast creature called Goldeneye, came flying down from the ether. The bird soared down into the water. Then it rose and descended again. It sped around in desperate panic, finding no place to land or to rest. The martyr looked at its tired fluttering. She remembered when she herself had been helpless. The great mother lifted her knee above the waters, offering the golden eye a nesting place. The bird then landed upon the soft vastness of the mother's knee. Golden eye, weary from its long search, settled down and started feathering her soft plumes into a nest. Ilmater stared in wonder as the bird began to lay her clutch. First came a smooth golden egg, then a second, then the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, all alike to the first, shining like gold and round as the mother's belly. At last Goldeneye produced the final egg, the seventh, unique from all the others. It was dark, a heavy and dull iron grey where the others were light and bright golden. The bird, exhausted, then lay down on the clutch upon the mother's knee, warming her eggs from the frigid waters. But this time of peace and solitude was not to last. The eggs, cold as the metal they were made of, became shining red and then scorching white until they burned the soft skin of the mother's knee. She suddenly screamed in pain, kicked desperately, and in that furious movement seven red-hot eggs fell down and as they hit the oceanic floor, they shattered into pieces. When she calmed, the mother finally looked around to find her friend, but the bird had flown away. Ilmater looked down in her sadness and then marveled, for none of the egg was lost. Each fragment of shell, each piece of the inner part was still there, and as she watched them settle, the miraculous occurred. The first half of the iridescent golden envelopes became the terra firma beneath us, and the other the celestial dome of sky, magnificent upon the earth. The yellow yolks ran together to form a single glowing globe, the sun, and from the clear white came the silvery moon. The other tiny fragments became stuck to the dome, becoming the stars over our heads. And the dark of the lost egg, the chosen of Uko, formed the storms which darkened the sky. The mother, mighty and pregnant, was not alone any more. She now had the sun to warm her. She now had the moon to lighten her nights. Joyful, she floated and admired all the newness around her. Then she started to dream. She lifted her head to begin her own magic, and with her hands Ilmater caused the land to rise. She made hills, mountains, dunes, and water streams, all with the twining of her big lovely fingers. With her foot pointed downwards, she danced the depths of the ocean, and painted the large fissures in the mountain sides. She dipped her toes into the land, making lakes as a safe place for the fish. The baby, though, remained still unborn, still within her body. She turned round and plunged her body into the waters. There she formed the abysses of the ocean and the caves to protect the sea fish. Rising up, she planted islands on the surface, some big, others as small as rocks. And she smiled. Her creation was complete. And so the water mother became the mother of the earth. But the child was still unborn, still inside. <laughs> Seven hundred years the mother had labored with her unborn son. The child, unseen and unknown, had given itself the name Vanyamwenya. All this time he had grown mightily impatient, and now, with his mother's work finally behind, he chose that now was the time. In his desperation, Vanyamwenya, by now a wizened old man, an eternal sage, Finally crawled on his hands and knees and forced himself out of Ilmata. From here, we lose track of the fate of dear Ilmata. For eight long years he swam the four directions, taking in the vastness as his mother before him had. Finally he came to a lonely island, 
and stepped out of the waters onto the firm and barren ground. And in this way the son of magic came to live in the earthly realm, upon the land that would one day birth all of the Finns. Vainyamoinen knew of his great powers of the voice. He had honed them through long years as he inspired his mother's creative works. He dwelt for many years in this barren landscape, contemplating how to best make it new, how to bring forth life, as Ilmata and Goldeneye before. <laughs> Ajetti hyö vastakkahe, aisapa tarttui aisan piehän. Draped in his dripping cloak of seaweed, he sang a summoning, and with his magic he summoned from Uko's hall the sprightly Pelervoinen, the impish god of plants and forests. And Panyamoinen knew that with Pelervoinen's magic he could begin a new dawn, begin a new work. After Pelervoinen's sowing, the land rapidly became covered in sprouts and flowers, and trees of various likes. But the sacred oak refused to grow. And so Vainyamoinen waited for the acorn to sprout, to leave its shell and to become the sacred oak. But after his long dormancy, Vainyamoinen was not a patient man. It was then that Vainyamoinen spotted five water nymphs tending grasses and flowers upon the seashore. He watched as they mowed and moved the shoots about, raking them into a bunch. And thus his impatience was rewarded. Mighty Ikutorsu rose from the sea and compacted the bales of grass when the maidens had finished their work. The bales quickly kindled with magic, and the flames shot up to the very heavens, reducing the bale to ash. The maidens then set about to gather the ashes and work them into the soil bearing the acorn. The ground was enriched, and the acorn grew. In fact, it grew until the sun and moon were blotted out, and the canopy of the great oak filled the very dome of the sky. The plants and animals suffered greatly in the perpetual twilight, and they called for release. When the darkness was almost too much to bear, Banyamoinen called out for the strength to fell the evil oak. He called upon Cup, the daughter of Ether, and his own mother, asking for the power of water. And in reply to his singing plea, a tiny man strode forth from the waters. Vanyamoinen at first mocked the tiny man, calling him a pygmy hero, useless to him and better off to perish. The tiny hero only responded with a smile and revealed his true form. He grew into a great giant whose head pierced the clouds. He stood and sharpened his axe with six hard blocks of sandstone. He took three great steps, and in four blows felled the mighty tree to the ground. And so the tree with a hundred branches scattered to the four winds, trunk to the east, treetops to the west, branches to the north, and leaves to the south. Then Vanyamoinen was filled with great inspiration. Vanyamoinen then lifted the trunk with his great voice, and set it in the center of the world, a pillar extending towards the dome of the sky. There he affixed the dome of sky to the pillar, with the polar star as linchpin, so the dome may forever turn. And thus, Vanyamoinen prepared man to read the changing of the seasons. And after this first beginning, there were only gods and spirits, the holy people. The first ones, though, quickly grew tired of the tasks of daily living. And so, some time after the beginning, they began to make men and women from the earthly mud. These new ones, these human beings, would take up the toils of the first ones and do their bidding. And in this way, Earth became home to all of us, the likeness of the first magical people. So this is the tale of the beginning. Ilmater, the lovely air maiden, the fertile water mother, and the mighty mother of Earth. The mother of Vainyamoinen, Ilmarinen, and Lemminkainen, the heroes of the Finnish folk the mother of all the fishes, the soil, the hills, and the rocks. Then, from the songs of magic, came the plants to cover the earth, and creatures to eat them. Finally, when the gods wearied of tending to all this, they made us, and we, fierce and fragile, awoke to all we needed to exist and thrive. We can only imagine that old Uko, 
the lord of the primordial ether, looked down upon all of this and smiled. It's, it's a fairly lengthy legend from the first two poems of the Kalevala. In part two of Finnish mythology, we will explore the travels and troubles of Vainamoinen and his brothers, as they interact with the fierce witch queen Loki and her beautiful daughters, far away in frozen Pohjola.